And then the car outwardly is configured to be like a Formula One car. So it was never supposed to exist. <laughs> KW makes the perfect suspension for every demand. Find them in the description below. What's up, people? So today I am doing some welding on the Formula One hot rod build, but I wanted to just show you guys the stage that it's in right now, the ugly duckling stage, but it's actually getting really smart. So come on over, let's check it out. I see we're here with the Genius Garage race cars and my new Lotus Esprit. Well, it's not new, 1985, but it's very cool. And that's gonna be a fun one coming up. So I hope you guys come back. But here is the Formula One hot rod build. And I think it's kind of neat looking at it right now because in a way I was kind of bummed to show you guys this video because it doesn't look like much. It just looks kind of less sad. It looks like sort of a mechanical slug right now, which is not glamorous. And it does, it looks like a big black metal slug. But the reason this stage I think is really important to the build for you guys to take a peek at is we're getting to a point where things are getting really particular and finalized into the very important parts of the frame. Because the magic that had happened to create this vehicle has everything to do with this space frame. And the reason being is simple. So the concept of this was effectively to create like an early 90s Formula One car that would be in effect a great race car, very versatile, you could do crazy stuff with it like autocross it and whatnot, uh, but without spending Formula One money. And to do that, you want it to be as real as possible and have it create and fill a need and a purpose that never existed. Because honestly, Formula One cars are really light and delicate and way overly specialized. That's why they're expensive and stupid. You can't do anything else with them. Expend, spend lots of money on it and go faster than most people can actually drive. So what we did was this is an early 90s, 1990 Lola Indy car, carbon fiber and aluminum monocoque here tub which basically has the exact same shape and size as the f1 cars at the time very similar but of course the indy car has 15 inch magnesium wheels instead of smaller one like formula one which makes it a lot easier to get different kinds of tires that work and you've got your way more readily available in terms of your brakes your carbon fiber ducting the suspension everything so it's very similar and then of course reconfiguring the wings as they would be in formula one but this car, if you guys recall, is using this really cool Hayabusa motor that is highly modified and came out of a radical. Now it's super dirty right now because there's been a lot of grinding and welding and all kinds of stuff going on, but I need it for fitment in terms of all the mounting. And this engine, if you guys recall, has a billet uh, knife edge crank, like Gorilla rods, higher compression, really kick-ass race cams, dr full dry sump, spins high, got some really nice carbs on it, just everything, the works. It's actually a very expensive motor right here, and that was the whole point, the reason we bought that old Radical, just to take apart for its guts. Now, it's in longitudinally, so it can in fact still be chain drive to this limited slip differential from Taylor Engineering down in Texas. They build these for cars just like this and builds, maybe Formula 1000 or even Formula SAE teams. And in this circumstance, it works perfectly well here as well. So it's called a trapeze with a limited slip differential. And if you come around over to this side, Aaron, you can see that the drive sprocket is highly offset to this flange. Now this flange got some adapter plates, which I will in fact be able to adapt to the stock CV housing whoosh, of the IndyCar. <laughs> Here they are. Uh, this was uh, laser cut out of very nice steel, so I have to locate it make uh, the countersunk points because this will in fact bolt here to adapt it and then I will be able to bolt on the IndyCar CVs. So that'll be really neat. Now in regard to the frame here a lot of things are not yet triangulated and finalized so right now what we're doing is getting all the important points. So I can locate the original IndyCar suspension in point. These, uh, the assembly here with the shocks and the bell cranks um, and triangulating and getting everything right. So right now it's really exciting because today uh, mostly finalized the actual chain and the differential, having it perfectly in line. The motor is finalized in its place and it mounts on all of the stock locations where the motor in the original Hayabusa motorcycle was a stressed member. And in this circumstance, it's also a partially stressed member. It isn't fully important that the engine is in the frame, but the engine being in the frame makes the entire car a lot stiffer. So there was some, some, interesting compromises in building this. But going back to my point earlier in the video, this frame is the magical part. And this is also the most difficult part because this car was never supposed to exist like this. We've got the Lola IndyCar carbon fiber monocoque. 
We've got all of the suspension arms, the A-arms and pushrod suspension and assemblies that originally attached to the transaxle that's here that could be reused again in the future or if we ever want to reconfigure the car with a different motor. We've got an engine that was for a motorcycle and then remade to go in a car, which is train, chain drive. And we have a specially built limited slip differential and trapeze to go extreme over that is then adapted to run the IndyCar transaxles. And then the car outwardly is configured to be like a Formula One car. So it was never supposed to exist. Nobody's ever quite built a car like that. There's some similar ones like Formula 1000s and stuff, but this is of course on steroids. So that ends up being the magic. And that's why this part has been so massively time consuming because Obviously the magic of the car is the concept. Figuring out that these are all the best components to put together to give you the uh, final result. But the car is more than just a concept. It's more than thinking about it. It's the ability to actually execute and put those things together in something that's functioning. So this is what that is. And once this is finalized here shortly, and the car comes apart and it'll all be stripped down and blasted and painted and made beautiful and everything will be cleaned up and put back together. Then it's just a matter of finishing the car, the basic plumbing, the electronics, interior, all that jazz. And it's just, at that point, it's just a car configured like an F1 car. And it's really cool. So that's why this has been so massively time consuming. And the other thing is the creative juices that it requires to build this is somewhat mind numbing because I don't get to re-engineer the mounts on the motor. I don't get to re-engineer a lot of things. I got to make a bunch of stuff that doesn't want to work together, work together in a way that I can actually fabricate that will work. It'll stand the test time. It won't fall apart and it'll be, you know, good, good car, good piece. And that's tricky. Uh, and along the way, frankly, I've made some mistakes, no mistakes with regard to structural, but Something where, for instance, the way the engine mounts, you have to remove the engine. So if you all notice, there's a Allen bolt here and an Allen bolt here, and you can't see the other two here. But these pieces right here that are welded to the tubes are a joint. Actually, I'm gonna get rid of this stupid thing here. Get rid of this jacket too. I'm frying. Oh, that's better. Whew. Okay, so this tube is removable. You remove this Allen bolt and this one and the two back here and this tube, once you unbolt it from the motor, is removable. And I did it this way because normally with a race car, if you want to take the engine out or whatnot, you split the car in half. You unbolt it from the carbon fiber and aluminum monocoque and you separate the rear frame and you bring the engine out. Well, that's a pain in the butt. And for future people that don't want to deal with that pain in the butt, if they ever want to remove the motor and service it, you'd rather leave the car together. So even if it's not completely structurally you know, sound or whatnot in terms of that, you can at least take the car in your garage, you can block it up on the bottom, you can simply remove this tube, unbolt the motor mounts, and then the motor will be free to be removable. You just take loose the mount in the rear, you undo these nuts and bolts and you slide the shaft out. And then down here, the, the big trick of it is this mount, which you can see this nut here, the problem is it's a shaft that goes all the way through. And uh, go ahead and zoom out this way, Aaron. Right, right here, you'll be able to see it. The problem is, guys, that shaft, you can't slide it out anymore because this tube that really, really, really needs to be here is in the way. I don't want to put a hole in it. I don't want it to kink. I don't want to move it to a different place. And I don't want to have to make that entire tube removable just for that. So in this circumstance with the lower motor mounts, those motor mounts, instead of just being a hole that the shaft slides to, you can loosen the shaft and it stays in the motor. And then you take everything else out and the motor can be lifted right out because those mounts on the chassis on the bottom are open at the top. So it can be popped out, which alleviates the need to slide that shaft out the side where it can't come because of this. So I know that sounds like a very small detail, but it was the best compromise to make everything work because I, I really wanted that tube to be welded in place and permanent and not removable. And that's why I was able to boil this da design down to where only one tube has to re be removable to take the engine out. So you take this tube off, you got the two bolts, and this one hasn't been welded yet, but the two bolts here for the motor. I also want to point out that not all the welding is done. There's welds that still have to be done when it's all taken apart that you get it from the inside. There's still tubes that aren't in it yet. So armchair quarter bracks, we're not done yet. But anyway, so this will be removable. Then you dismount the motor, you dismount it from that side. And what you'll be able to do at that point is you'll be able to gently rock the motor like this. It comes loose at the back and you'll be able to move it forward 
a couple of inches. And then from there, it's literally just pulling the engine out this way. So by making this one tube removable with these very nice structural um, bosses made specifically for a, a cage like this, that's, that's how that's gonna work. So we've been working on our big gussets, triangulation. I still have the rest of the bulkhead to finish back here and some strengthening going on underneath there. And I'll be including sheet metal, basically creating a monocoque in some areas, potentially throughout here, rather than just being all tubes. So still a few considerations that have to be done there. There's still gonna be some support here going down. And it's neat because the motor effectively, not effectively, it, it is in fact, part of a stress member. The motor is part of the chassis, but it's not completely stressed. So it'll certainly be able to withstand and, and you know, take care of it. So I'm pretty happy. Um, the, the car is effectively a very overbuilt Formula 1000 in that circumstance that's configured as an F1 car with IndyCar stuff and whatnot. So just based upon how robust IndyCars were, because they basically were built so you could go blasting off a wall, um, you know, over 200 miles an hour on an oval, unlike Formula 1 car that weren't really to do that. Um, so it's, it's tough. It should be something that can last a long, long time and be very cool. Um, and the framework and everything else is great in the back. Also, the nice thing about doing a steel frame like this is if you ever in the fact in the future needed to modify it, add a tab or something like that too, it's very, very simple, especially depending on what paint you use to do it because you can buzz off some of the paint, weld on a tab or whatnot, spot paint that area and you're good. So that's a, an aspect I really like about tube frames uh, when you're building a race car and doing that. And I'll show you one other thing. If you, if you guys notice, another compromise that had to happen here. So this is a note up here, and there's still gussets and things that have to happen, so don't, don't get bogged down in the details. But this tube, these two points here, I know they're in shear, but this is the point that goes to the hard point of the monocoque up here, and there's some hard points down low. There actually isn't a point here, but we're able to create this on a flat plane that goes directly against this magnesium bulkhead and effectively triangulates it well on the outside. Not totally needed, but something we can get away with. And there's a little bit of tab action I'll do, not to locate it in tension, but just trust me, it'll work. But here you'll notice this tube comes in at the top. I would rather be in the middle so it distributes better upon both of these. However, the problem with that is where the motor ends up and the two mounts are. So if this tube were to go over the starter here and then bend slightly to come to here, the trouble is you, you'd be right on that. So, and this will be triangulated down here. So this tube is effectively going into the top and we'll spread some of the load here. We may or may not, but it, it does work well. And that was the ability to have the straightest tube possible that isn't gonna be in bending without adding a lot of other things. And if you wanna come over the other side, I'll show you the other side here too. I'm just starting. Now this one was a lot simpler. It was able to be a dead straight shot here to the center of this area. So I'm really happy with that execution, obviously. And the ability to create the structure mounts for the two mounts on the head. Uh, this bolt had to be shortened a little bit with a little bit less threads going in so it can be removed and then come out. But it, um, it works nicely. It's captive now because of that, the way it's welded in, but it, it still works very nicely. So I was happy with that. The other difficulty is if you want to go over there by the welding table and just look down the back side of it here, the engine for, for the width of the head and the, blo the uh, block where the cylinder bank is, shall we say there's only one bank, is slightly offset. And that had to be done for the drive, the chain drive, because this sprocket is at an extreme point on the left. Generally speaking, when people make a limited slip differential with a chain drive, it's more in the middle and then they have to offset it, have different size drive shafts and such. But I really wanted to use the stock IndyCar half shafts or drive shafts with the CVs and to do that it had to be centered and that's why we got the beautiful trapeze and limited slip differential from Taylor Engineering because they're the only ones that make something that is off the, you know, off the shelf practice, very nice, that is way offset. But even with it being offset, with that being centered and the nature of where the drive is, still had to slightly offset the motor. And if I come back here, I don't have the exact measurement off the top of my head, but you know, it's inch and a quarter offset, which is really not hateful. It's not going to do anything, uh, shall we say, of any real noticeability to, um, weight and balance, it really isn't. Uh, and it shouldn't affect the bodywork. I believe that the bodywork can just go over that. We may have to put a little bulge in it just for one of these mounts, 
But that was the other thing. I wanted to all fit within the bodywork so it looks really, really pretty in terms of it being um, that of a, emulating a Formula One car of the early 90s. So that's the build, you guys. Uh, from here, this week, I'm gonna be finalizing the triangulation. Um, and the tiny details, just bogging it down, guys. Just little, getting things drilled perfectly, square, making the gussets, making so everything can be taken apart and put back together and taken apart and put back together. And just the ability for this whole differential and everything to come out and fit requires a lot of brain power and a lot of thought and methodical workmanship. So. Once this is structural, which is coming very soon, the corners, they've been cleaned up and painted and made beautiful. So the fronts are kind of ready to sit down. The corners will be bolted back on and that'll all be good, the wings and such. And then at that moment, we're gonna be able to get this thing, take it off the table and put it on the ground, which I can't wait for that because then I can throw the under tray on, start fitting body panels, doing all that, any tabs and stuff I need to do there. And then when all that's finalized, in terms of the structure of it, the wings and the body panels, once it gets on the floor, which is gonna be happening late this week and next week, that's when this gets totally finalized. And what I can do is take it apart, take it all apart, because then the steel frame in the rear will get cleaned up entirely and painted, you know, with something nice, um, obviously so it looks good, but it doesn't get rusty and everything like that, but you can modify it in the future if you need. So when that's being painted and where we're cleaning up these old IndyCar parts and making it all look as nice as you can, I will open up, take the bulkhead off and get inside here where it's gonna have a fuel tank as well as the swirl tank for the, um, which is over here. So the fuel tank's actually in it, which is aluminum. And I did that because if you put a bladder in it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't stand the test of the time. And this isn't gonna be race race. So there's no sense for a bladder. So it has an aluminum cell. Now this is the original oil tank from the Lola, which is a bigger capacity than we need, but it's a really nice zoomy thing that will fit. You can see these nice mounts that go, that mount to the magnesium bulkhead here. It's about a quarter inch thick. And then you can fill it up here and you've got your lines and such that come out of it for the motor. So we'll be able to utilize this and that goes inside. And then you have your aluminum fuel tank. So those mounts will have to be done off to clean up the inside and get the lines, oil lines and things like that. And those A and lines and such I can get from JAG, Summit, Speedway Motors, any of those types of places and order them and uh, get it plumbed and ready. And then also I have to look at it in terms of what I have to do for throttle cable, the shift cable. I'll have to fabricate that for the shifter because the Indy car from this time period, and if you want to look down inside here, be my guest, Indy cars from this time period still had an H pattern dog box, which frankly, I really wish Indy cars in Formula One still had that because it took a heck of a lot of talent to do that. And if the driver screwed up, he could blow up the engine and transaxle. And if racing was still that way, it would be a lot more interesting to watch and a lot more difficult for the drivers, but they're just stupid paddles now, which is too easy in my opinion. So the shifter goes right here, but it was an H pattern. Uh, so what we're gonna have to do is I'm gonna modify that so it can just be a push pull cable to shift the sequential uh, gearbox of the motorcycle transmission. So that'll be neat. Also, we have a very beautiful gauge here that's part analog, part digital, which will fit on the original mounts of that, which we'll refinish and make nice. Here are the pneumatic shocks, or not shocks, but um, lifts for the front of the car. And I'll likely put on the rear so the pneumatic lift system could be utilized again. Then of course, it's gonna need the seat belts and stuff put on, which is relatively easy. You can still see the masking tape here. There is some steel and chromoly used in this that are all welded. In fact, the uprights are welded sheet steel made so they're the light and strong and they're easy to prototype back then. So those are things that need to be finished and just cleaned up so they don't corrode. Um, but that's the stage, guys. So come back for hopefully next week. This thing will be on the ground and looking like a car, which I am very excited about. And we will be starting to fit the under tray and side panels. But just wanted to give you guys a rundown. I know some of you are disappointed I'm not showing you the work being done on it. But I would just say, please be patient with me because with this build, I have to actually get it done. Um, and for me to set up a camera or magically have camera people more than just showing you guys what's going on, it is massively time consuming and planning. And right now I need all the time and bandwidth I possibly have to finishing this and doing a really, really quality product. Um, but there's a lot of fun to happen. Obviously a lot more neat cars. You got Casey's 80s garage going strong again with the Esprit and the Alpha that's over in the other room. So naturally guys, please hit that bell when you subscribe and I look forward to see you next time. Well, a huge thank you to Crush Proof Tubing Company. Since 1949 in Macomb, Ohio, they've been manufacturing custom rubber and plastic tubes 
for every industry imaginable. No tooling or mold costs, fast and free custom samples, and American-made quality is what sets them apart. But for me, I'm most excited about their exhaust evacuation kit. Different modular pieces and their convoluted custom hoses make it so that I can adapt any car, truck, or motorcycle with an internal combustion engine to get those exhaust gases out of my shop so I can keep working in safety and comfort. But beyond just that, they build a variety of hoses for a custom OEM world. You'll see stretchable drain tubing and bellows, as well as agriculture, medical, and military. So again, guys, Crush Proof Tubing Company, crushproof.com, and go down in the description below to see where to get your free samples for industry or your exhaust tubing.